Today, I want you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 16. We'll come to the fifth sign that John talks about Jesus. This um, sign that John talks about is, um, is to so show that Jesus is the master of all the elements. Uh, let's look at that. Chapter 6, verses 16 uh, to 21. We are in the middle of a series called The Master's Sign, which uh, John talks about seven signs in his, uh, in his gospel, showing uh, each sign, showing something uh, great about who Jesus is, showing something about the divinity of Jesus Christ. And uh, this one sign is probably one of the most uh, uh, written uh, in a very calm manner. That's, that, that, that's one of the things that caught me by surprise when I began to read uh, um, this miracle. John chapter 6, verse 16. When the evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea of Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near to the boat, near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now, immediately after we see um, a, a miracle, the last week that we saw the miracle uh, where Jesus uh, took five loaves and two fish and fed nearly uh, 20,000 people in, in one sitting. Uh, after such a grand miracle, the next story that John talks about, this, uh, the sign that John talks about, um, he writes it in such calm manner, um, you know, we might actually miss the whole thought behind what John is uh, trying to uh, write there. Whenever we talk about this particular miracle, Jesus walking on the water, we focus on Peter more. I don't know if you realize that. We talk a lot about Peter. We talked about how Peter got out of the boat and walked down the water and... Um, uh, you know, how, what kind of faith we require. And of course, I'm going to talk about that too today. But we focus more on Peter. We forget to focus on Jesus. That's probably why John did not write about Peter at all in this story. Um, of course, Matthew wrote about that. We'll go back to Matthew at a later stage. Matthew, we see this, sto this uh, particular event in, in three Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and John. Luke doesn't talk about this. But Matthew, Mark, and John... And as we look at those three accounts of this particular incident and put them together, there are some amazing lessons to learn. But let's focus more on John today, and I'll do my concluding thoughts from Mark and Matthew. Uh, but let's look at what John is trying to teach us out of those uh, uh, few verses that he talks about um, Jesus walking on the water. I'll, uh, 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 you know, I'm not really doing a point sermon in this series, but... So I'm just going to pick up verses and, uh, and try and expose them. Verses 19. Uh, let me begin my thought from there. John 6, uh, verses 19. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the water. The whole focus of John writing that sign is only that sentence. They saw Jesus walking on the water on the water. Now, walking on the water is a, is, a, is a miracle of great proportion. We need to understand that. The density of water is one gram per cubic centimeter at four degrees Celsius. Okay? That's really thin. It simply means if you stand on the water, you will sink. That's what it, it actually means. There's no way anybody can actually stand and walk on the water. That's not going to happen. Humanly, uh, it's impossible. Now, here is the interesting thing. Water's surface tension, tension is, uh, is, um, 
uh, is so good that if you really run fast enough, you might actually run across the water. Water might actually hold you. But for that, you need to run at least 67 miles per hour. That means 107 kilometers per hour. You really have to run that fast in order to manage to allow the water to uh, hold you as you run. Now, as far as I know, the human history knows only one guy who is able to run um, the fastest in the entire human history, 27.5 miles. That's about 45 kilometers per hour. His name is Usain Bolt, you know, the trademark Usain Bolt. It takes 15 times more energy than that in order to stretch your body, to, to stretch your body in order to actually walk on the water, or to run on the water. Forget about walking on the water. So Jesus walking on the water really is a big miracle. It is a miracle of great proportions. We really need to understand that. If we have, you know, I love that to sink into your head. Um, I, I, I watched a YouTube video. Actually, I watched it in Discovery Channel. Um, um, I, I think a guy, a magician called Dynamo, uh, who one day in London, 2013, if I believe, um, just walked uh, on the Thames River. The first time, that was the first time I'm actually watching, and my, my jaws were open. If this guy is really doing this, there is no way I can show that Jesus is God. So I had to, you know, obviously I had to get into a research and I tried to find out what's happening. And thankfully, there's another show on the same channel called The Magician Secrets Revealed. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> and there is this masked magician who actually shows what, how all these street magicians do that. And he talked about how they use the acrylic boards already placed inside the, um, you know, I think one was Chris Angel who walked on the swimming pool and he showed how that can happen. And uh, um, another article in the Telegraph, which is, of course, trustworthy newspaper in UK, talked about how the police who uh, caught Dynamo were the fake ones and the audience were the fake ones and the camera angles were set up in such a way that it looked as if he's really walking on the water, but basically he's walking on the uh, something like what is an acrylic boat. So I can confidently now say nobody walked on the water except Jesus. And that itself shows him uh, as the divine one, as the one who came into this world in, in flesh, but still has the divine nature uh, in him. There's a guy called Dr. Doran Knopf, uh, who is a paleolimnologist. If you don't know what is paleolimnologist, uh, let me explain that to you. Paleolimnology is the study of old lakes. Okay? Paleo, old, limnology is the study of old lakes. Lakes, rivers, you know, small ponds. This Dr. Duff really did a, uh, you know, a long research and on, uh, on um, the Sea of Galilee and wrote an article saying that did Jesus really walk on the water? Okay? And he gave a proposition. After studying the Sea of Galilee for a long time and doing a wrong research on the Sea of Galilee, he found out that Sea of Galilee sometimes experiences uh, an interesting natural climatic phenomenon. That sometimes, even though it is near to desert, and Sea of Galilee has more uh, higher um, degrees of heat than any other place in Israel, and he said, even though it has high degrees of heat, there are times when the sea um, can experience floating ice, chunks of floating ice on it, the Sea of Galilee. And it can happen once in thousand years. It can. It may. Okay, please get that point. It may happen once in thousand years. And in that sense, Jesus probably served on a floating ice. That was his conclusion. So he never really walked on the water. He had a floating ice that is already on the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus uh, took that to surf across uh, the Sea of Galilee. Now I'm amused by this guy. The point is, if walking on the water is a miracle by its own sense, surfing an ice 
in the sea of galilee which is in a storm actually is much more bigger miracle than that i don't know how he didn't get that have you ever tried to surf i've seen surfing and uh, you know i've been as you know few months back i was in hawaii and i saw how the surfers uh, really struggle to actually stand on the boat um uh, sorry on their surfboard um when 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 these uh, waves are probably about 15 feet high so for jesus to actually pull off that stunt even if he was doing it on the floating ice uh, to surf across the sea he really did a great miracle it still is a miracle both ways i guess that's what john was trying to prove to all of us there is nothing too big for jesus there is no um, miracle of great proportion that jesus cannot do let's move on as we keep moving on uh, in that um, uh, in that uh, um, passage i want to take you back to little back uh, to actually bring you to one very important lesson that i want to teach you in verses 18 the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing now i uh, i want you to place yourself in the sea of galilee now sea of galilee is about 7 uh, miles wide that's about 12 kilometers 12.5 kilometers whatever about uh, wide and 17 miles in length that's about 27 kilometers um at the deepest point the sea of galilee is about uh, 150 in depth you're talking about the middle of the sea of galilee it's about 150 feet depth in depth and these guys are 6 kilometers that's 3 or 4 miles that's what bible says right 3 or 4 miles in the sea that means they're actually in the middle of the sea of galilee okay keep that thought in your head because that's what that's how i'm going to conclude that but keep that so when jesus is actually walking he is right in the middle of the sea of galilee that is caught in a storm and wind was blowing you know the power of wind we have already experienced this twice in our city in the span of one month uh, in you know within actually two weeks in the in the month of may we saw how much kind of destruction wind can bring now on a really really stormy day in the sea of galilee the height the the height of the waves at the high tide can go up to 25 feet even though it's a small sea it still can bring that kind of waves uh, in 1997 i believe uh, there was a huge storm that uh, you know the sea of galilee experienced that the 15 15 feet high waves have hit the city of tiberias tiberias is on the other side where jesus uh, fed the 5000 people by the way uh, 20000 people uh that city was uh, uh, completely destroyed a few years back in 1997 when the sea of galilee got into a storm so that i'm talking about that kind of rough sea this whole picture gave me something about jesus uh showed me a different picture of jesus it showed me that jesus is a daredevil now i know the word daredevil can look very negative and it's uh, in its connotation but dare the devil etymologically means daring the devil if you don't know that jesus actually has been the one who is always daring the devil we you know there's a poet by the name of dorothy sayers who uh, wrote about jesus uh, how we look at jesus saying that that we have lobotomized jesus we have cut down the personality of jesus to be just a meek man meek person but jesus is a fearsome guy he is he he is really a daring guy and the, you know the um she wrote a poem that i don't want to read that but it kind of put my head into perspective she kind of uh talked about how we show a castrated jesus that's the word she used castrated jesus to the world as if jesus is only a meek person because he hung on the cross and there is nothing he can do apart from love but jesus is a fear fear some guy look at him in mark mark chapter 4 if i'm not wrong uh, wh- when he entered uh, um uh, into a place uh, uh, crossing sea of gerasenes you remember jesus met a guy mark chapter 
Jesus met a guy who was demon possessed, demoniac. He's not possessed by one demon. What was he possessed by? He calls himself legion. It's a Roman term. Mark, by the way, uses a lot of Roman terms in order to explain his story. Whenever you read Mark, you see a lot of Roman uh, references in his, uh, in his gospel. That's because he's writing to Romans, by the way. And so Mark uses the word legion. Now, in Roman army, whenever you um, call a group of a bunch of people a legion, you're talking about 6,000 people. 6,000 people. If this guy had a legion of demons inside him, how many demons are inside him? 6,000. Have you ever seen one person possessed by one demon? Anybody here? Yeah, some of us. Some of us saw the demons expressed itself in our youth camps. I was at a youth camp in Word and Deed, uh, uh, I think it was in 2002 or 2001, I don't remember. And uh, I, was, I was doing all the arrangements. I was the background guy uh, for our, you know, AG youth camp. And um, it so happened one day after all the arrangements, I was so tired. I, um, I wanted to sit down and just experience the worship. And unfortunately, that is the day the guy decided that he would show himself up. So there is this guy who, possessed by demon, began to manifest within the worship while we were worshiping. And so all the preachers, pastors, everybody, I didn't want to go there. I just wanted to sit down and watch. And so I was just watching. Please don't mind your pastor for today. <laughs> I really, I was scared. So I sat down at the back. I said, no, I don't want to go near to them. Because if I go, what if he talks about my life? So that's one thing I didn't want to allow him to do. So, and so I, I sat down there. I watched this guy. You got to believe me. A person who possesses one demon has a lot of strength. I don't know if you've ever seen a uh, word and deed. Word and deed has a big chapel which has a huge, huge doors okay, on both sides. I think four, six doors. They are at least double the size of our, our doors there. I'm talking about 12 feet, 10 to 12 feet high. And th that big. And they're made up of single wood, you know. That means you can just, it's a single door. You can actually open it. You can imagine the size of, of the doors. This guy was manifesting so hard that he walked up to one of the doors and simply plugged it. And threw it on everybody who's trying to pray. I mean, this actually happened, by the way. Literally did that. Now imagine 6,000 people in one guy. 6,000 demons, sorry, not people. 6,000 demons in one single guy. That's probably why nobody could resist him. That's what the Bible says, right? Nobody could control him. No matter how many times he's put in the chains, he would simply break them off. This is, a, this is one guy nobody can control. Now, I don't know why the Bible doesn't talk about it, but I, would, I was trying to imagine, the Bible says... When Jesus got out of the boat and started walking in this, in this graveyard towards that guy, that village, the Bible says the man, the, this, this guy, the legion, began to run towards Jesus. I, I'm sure Matthew and Mark purposefully did not write about what's happening behind Jesus. No, you didn't get it, did you? <laughs> you didn't get it. If I was Peter, or if I was James, John, standing behind Jesus, imagine what would be running in my heart. 6,000 demons in one person walking, running towards you, that's a dangerous situation to be in. And Jesus simply walks towards him. Nobody paints that picture, didn't they? Truth is, uh, that's what Jesus calls us to become. That's what faith actually means. To stand in the face of a legion and not to be worried about it. A fearless Jesus, we see um, in that. And I guess that's what John was trying to show to us, saying that this Jesus that you believe in is, is a dead devil. He did dare the devil. 
And because uh, of who he is, he has absolute control over everything around us. Irrespective of how intimidating our circumstances are around us. Whether they are like legion, or whether they are like uh, you sitting in the boat, caught up in a storm in the middle of the Sea of Galilee with high tide and, and a wind that is almost throwing you off, you, off the boat, um, God can control anything. You remember the similar kind of incident had happened uh, at another time in the Sea of Galilee again, when the Sea of Galilee was caught in the storm, Jesus was sleeping in the boat and the disciples were so scared these are expert fishermen. That means they know how to row a boat. They have seen their fair share of storms in the Sea of Galilee. They have endured through that. But they themselves were afraid of their own lives. That's what the Bible says. They were scared for their lives. So much that they had to wake up Jesus and say, Are you not worried about us? They were scared for their life. And they saw how Jesus got up. And calm the sea with one word. Just by saying quiet. The God that you believe in, the God that you have right now, the God that you have faith in, Jesus, has absolute control over everything that is around you. Except you. You don't like that. You may not agree with me, but that's the truth. He has control over everything, absolutely everything in this world, except you. That's the next verse. When Jesus walked towards them in the water, what happened? What happened there? They were, they were frightened. Funny, Jesus can control the nature. Jesus can take five fish and two loaves and distribute it to 20,000 people. Five loaves and two fish, sorry. For my mathematics. But Jesus does not have control over your life, over your mind, unless you give it to him. I'll talk about how to give it to him. But till the day you give it to him, he doesn't have control. If you choose to be in fear, live in fear, there's nothing God can do about it. God can control your storm, the same storm that you are right now in. God can take you out of the debt that you are in right now. God can open the door that is shut so much for you. He can do that. He has control over everything except you. Uh, if you don't allow your fear to get over to, uh, to faith, uh, he cannot do anything about it. If you keep allowing fear to engulf you, there is nothing God can do. You see, we naturally fear what our memory cannot recognize. Remember this. We naturally fear what, what our memory cannot recognize. That simply means this. If you forgot what God has done in the past, you will not be able to live with courage in the present. And, the fa and faith um, basically disappears from within your life. If you forget that God is the God of everything, of impossibilities, that impossible is nothing for Him, that He has absolute control over everything, every circumstance that you're facing in your life right now, um, then you will be filled with fear. There's a, um, I don't know how many of you follow TED Talks, follow TED Talks. Um, the, I, I don't remember the guy, I think it's Al, Al Shyam or something like that, I forgot his name, who, who is a behavior psychologist. He, uh, he's an expert in cognitive um, thinking and you know, stuff like that. And he did a talk on how people, people's belief is um, defined by what they see. Okay? How our perceptions actually shape our beliefs. And uh, in one of the talks, he talked about um, a sketch that he presented to different kinds of people, a, a drawing that he did, 
when he showed it to adults, they immediately perceived that image to be one. When he showed it to children, children perceived that image to be something else. He did an ima he, whenever he presented it to the adults, uh, every adult immediately recognized it as two people in deep embrace, in, in an intimate uh, position. Uh, that was the image. Every adult who saw that, they always looked at that that way. And when he showed it to children, almost every child saw that image as nine dolphins. Interesting, isn't it? No connection between both of their perceptions. And then he concludes this, that what we know limits our perceptions, uh, limits what we, you know, the percep our perceptions of what we see. Our knowledge limits our understanding of what we see. You got the idea now? That's what he proposes. And he says, if you don't know something, whatever you see is limited to the knowledge that you already have, and therefore you perceive everything based on that and believe it. Now you understand what I'm trying to drive it. So if your knowledge of God is limited, then what you see is limited by that perception. You know, you start understanding everything based on that understanding, that knowledge that you have and perceive everything in that, in that box. That's why the disciples were frightened. Their cognitive memory does not have space for supernatural. Mark talks about that. Mark chapter, uh, chapter 6, verses 52. Mark concludes saying they could not understand it because they did not remember the things of loaves. I mean, the incident just happened the same, you know, that same morning. They forgot what Jesus did on the top of the mount, taking five loaves and two fish and distributing it to 20,000. They actually forgot about that, so they were frightened. Amazing. If you're fear-filled right now about your future, that simply means your understanding of God is really limited. That you're not doing any effort towards growing in your knowledge of God. That you're not allowing God uh, to do uh, um, stuff uh, in your life. Actually, God is doing, I don't know if you know this, that God is always at work in our lives because we don't see it, we don't know God, we don't understand God much, we don't see what's happening around us. If you make um, me listen to um, the symphony of, oh, this guy, what's his name? Um, how did I forget his name? Uh, the Mozart. And I, I, am I listening? If I'm listening, and if Joseph is listening, you know who Joseph is, right? In our church. I'm not talking about biblical Joseph. Uh, the Joseph, the, the one who plays keyboard. If Joseph is listening to the same Mozart, same symphony, and me listening to the same symphony, we both perceive that music differently. My knowledge of music is less. So therefore, for me, as long as it is pleasing to my ears, I listen. For Joseph, it's not just about pleasing, it's all about notes, it's all about the tempos, you know, all that stuff, if, if that is the right language to use for music. I don't know. You see, because he knows more, he recognizes more. I hope I made sense to you right now. Because of that, he can enjoy the music more. If you know God more, then you see more in your life. Last week, uh, I, I told you about how um, Prem and Swapna had experienced a very traumatic experience of uh, seeing their child run away from the home. You know, we, we, some of you don't know about this. Um, their um, eldest child had, you know, run away from home and we thought he was missing and then we searched for him and finally found out after three days that he's in Nepal. Now offhand, the story looks very simple. Okay? The guy took some money from home, ran away, went to Nepal. That's it. That's the story. 
Now, our natural tendency, if he's actually gone missing, our, uh, our natural tendency is to be sympathetic to the guy. But now that we know he ran away, our tendency to look at him is, mm, oh, that's the guy, Armada. Okay, now, let's, let's I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to limit your understanding of this guy, but I want to give you a new perspective on that. In those three days, in this journey of running from here to going to bus station or railway station or whatever he has gone and caught, and actually journeying all the way to Lucknow, and then crossing the border and reaching his hometown. That's another 12 hours journey, by the way, from Lucknow to uh, Prem's home. This 14-year-old boy doing that in three days, all alone, is an astronomical miracle. I don't know if you know this. I've heard horror stories of how children who are found lonely were caught and were either broken their legs and thrown into uh, the business of begging or, uh, or caught and thrown into the world of crime. But that he actually reached safely on the other side. In another country, he didn't even go to a next village. He's gone to another country, all alone. That is a miracle, if you understand your God. That me standing here right now, and bringing that word so confidently to tell you that God, is, that, you know, that is a miracle, is because that is exactly what happened in my life. My, my, I was in, I was in Chennai when this happened, and so, and um, I, I, the only thing I get updates are from from Janet, uh, what's happening, and our, me giving some instructions on what to do next. Um, so when we came back. Uh, I traveled back with my dad. And so because it was late night, by the time we reached Hyderabad, dad came home, he stayed back that night with us. And we were talking about, the next morning we were talking about, Janet was giving me an update about what happened with, uh, with Yusuf and, and how he reached there and all this stuff. In fact, we didn't know, till that point, we didn't actually know that he reached Nepal. And after we started talking, and um, by the time we came to know the whole story, that's when Prem called me and said, uh, Pastor, he's already reached to Nepal. And so, you know, uh, the serious talk then turned into a smile and, and we began uh, talking about that. And, and um, I told my dad, I was talking about that to my dad and said, the first thing that I told Janet is to go and search uh, the most familiar places for him. Go to Miyapur because that's a place he knows. Go to Bible college because he knows that place. He probably is hanging around that place. Or maybe go to a bus station or a railway station. That's where usually people who run away from home hang around. So my son looked at me and said, how do you know that? I looked at my dad and smiled. And my dad looked at him and said, because he knows it, he has done it. Now standing back here, after 25 years, I know it, it is an astronomical miracle. I didn't do it once, I did it five times, by the way. I don't know what's wrong with me. But in those five times, there are hundreds of hazards that I faced, hundreds of times that I could have been easily killed and got into the life of crime. But that God rescued me from there using different avenues. Some other time, I'll talk about those avenues. But bringing me back here to my home and then using my life to... Um, to do what I'm doing right now is a miracle by itself. You see, he's always doing miracles. The more you know, the more you see. See, that's what happened in the next verse. In verses 20, so Jesus looks at them and says, it is I, do not be afraid. Look at me and then you get faith. That's the point he's trying to say. Look at me. Recognize me. The more you see me, the more fear runs away from your life. It is I. Recognizing who he is, is the key to see the miracle around you. To see the miracle right now that's happening in you. Who doesn't want miracle? All of us want miracle. That's why we wrote uh, uh, you know, our, our expectations of God 
on, on that wall saying, oh, this is the miracle that I'm looking for. I have a, I'm, I'm actually waiting for a miracle to happen in my own life. I'm still expecting it to happen. All of us are looking for miracles. Yesterday I came to know about uh, one of our church members. Uh, um, at least he has been our church member uh, before he moved to Bangalore. Um, very active guy, a guy called Wesley Thampi in our church. And I came to know that his brother, who also came to our church for a few weeks, I believe, when he was here, um, is now uh, suffering with stage 4 cancer. He's young. He's young. He's not even married. I'm sure his parents are right now looking for a miracle. Now his miracle looks sick, looks big. I know mm, stage 4 cancer getting healed uh, is, is truly a miracle. But then before I walked up to the stage, somebody was talking to me and said, um, you know, something miraculous happened in my life. Uh, we, you know, they, they were going through a process for immigration and all that stuff. And uh, they had to go through the police verification. And, and he made in his heart that he's not going to pay when the policeman comes and does the verification. Now, that's, that's not possible in India. You know that, right? We know. Common sense tells us that we've got to give something, even if he doesn't ask. Because we are scared of our future. And he talked about how, in spite of others suggesting, elders suggesting, go ahead and do it. It's, it's, you know, you're doing it with a good intention, just do it. He, both of them, chose to say, no, we're, gonna, we're not going to do that. And how he saw that miracle taking place right in front of him, this this really hungry looking, you know, a guy looking really like a hungry lion. He compared himself with Daniel and the hungry lion. And said how this, you know, he really looked like this hungry lion who walked, sat, took all the details, took the fingerprints, took the witness signatures and walked away without even asking for money. That is a miracle for him. Another miracle. Somebody wrote an email to me because last week I chastened you, right? I asked you to write. And so one guy wrote an mir amazing miracle. Trust me, I also prayed for that. He wrote, he wrote a lot of miracles, but he wrote one. He said, last time when the World Cup football was happening, I prayed that Germany would win. <laughs> and Germany did win. Actually, I, do pray, I, do, I also prayed for that. You saw that? The more we start understanding God, the more we start seeing everything as a miracle. Everything around you becomes Beautiful thing things, things, things to see. That's what uh, uh, I think we got to understand. Faith is putting God between you and your circumstance. Let me explain that to you. Can I have three volunteers right now? Quickly. When you face the most difficult circumstances of your life, whatever those circumstances are, if you know how to put God in between you and, um, and your circumstances, then everything changes. Imagine Nikhil has a problem. And his problem is Uday. Whatever Uday is. Maybe he's a, he's a financial problem. Maybe he's a boss. And he does look like a boss. Do this, no? <laughs> uh, I don't know what, what, you know what can your problem is. But if Nikhil has this problem, and you know, I wish it was um, Vishal, he would have looked more thinner. But imagine if Vishal is facing um, this demoniac, uh, the legion, which is standing in front of him. Fear engulfs him because his circumstance is far bigger than him. And he knows that he's weak. He knows that there is no way by his strength, he can overpower uh, Uday. Is there anybody who can overpower Uday right now? And looking at him, you don't want to do that, right? That's why I chose him. So if, if your circumstance looks really intimidating, the only logical and the must thing to do, which we don't do, is to bring Jesus and make him stand in front of your problem. See, because Jesus is bigger than your problem, you can't see your problem. Your problem is still there. It's not going anywhere. Your demoniac is still there. 
Your financial trouble is still there. Your boat is still capsized by waters. You're still facing the wind. You're still facing the storm. Um, you're still have, you still have trouble. Right across, lurking around. But because of who is standing in between you and your circumstance, the way you look at your problem is different now. Because now you know that that guy can never cross this. Am I right? Yeah, you should. You should do that. If you understand. That is faith. Faith is putting God between you and your circumstance. You, you may be seated. That's the lesson you take away today. That if you can put God between you and your problem, then no fear in your life. No circumstance can intimidate you. So the more you learn, the more you appreciate, and the more you love God, the more you know God, the more you worship God. See, the knowledge of God, the more we know about God, uh, brings us to our knees. Brings adoration out of us. And here is the beauty of worship. We worship God because we now fall in love with God. And Bible says, Perfect love casts out. What? Isn't it interesting? I've always looked at that verse and thought, why that verse is like that? What has love to do with fear? Now it kind of dawned on to me. So the more I fall in love with God, and I can only fall in love with Him, God, with Him if I know more of Him. And the more I know Him, I love Him more. And the more I worship Him, that love casts out every fear from me. That's why the next verse says, now they gladly allowed Jesus to get into the boat. They were frightened one verse before. Then Jesus says, it is I. Don't be afraid. The fear is gone. They gladly allowed Jesus to come. I hope you understand what God is talking to you today. That if only you can know him. Now I know, um, as a theologian, it's not possible for you to know God. I mean, fully know God. I'm absolutely sure that you can never fully know God. I, now it took me three years of learning in the Bible college and then um, 18 years of ministry to understand that you can never know God fully. But at least you can know God. You got the point? You can never know God fully. But you can know God. That's why now I actually think the title for my subject, one of the subjects that I've learned in theology is called systematic theology. That means putting theology in system in, in a definitive form. Taking all the verses in the Bible and putting them in an order and trying to find out. I think it's systematic theology is an oxymoron. Because you can systemize God. If you can systemize God, then you don't need God. And the more you know God, the more you understand, I don't know God. I got to know more. You see, that thirst helps you to stay focused on Jesus. That's why I'm asking you to know. Not because I want you to have an exhaustive understanding of God, but the more you know God, the more you feel thirsty to know Him more. And that becomes your medicine for fear. Let me bring uh, all this into a conclusion. We saw that now, that there is nothing that God cannot control, that there is nothing God cannot do. Everything in this world is under the control of God except you. You are not under the control of God as long as you fear for your circumstance. The only way to get rid of the fear is to put Jesus between you and your circumstance. The more you know Him, the more you see Him, the more you see Him, the more everything becomes miraculous around you. Because the fear is taken away from you. I think that's what John was trying to teach us. Focus on a fearless God. Fear Him. You don't have to, fear of, you don't have, to have fear of anything else in your life. But I would not do justice to this miracle unless I talk about Peter, isn't it? You've got to talk about Peter. So I'm going to 
just highlight three verses from both Mark and Matthew, and I'll bring this to a conclusion. Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, verses 45. Mark chapter 6, verses 45. I had to read it at least five times for me to understand that one single verse. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before. One more time. If you don't read it again and again, you'll miss the whole point. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples to get into the boat. Funny, all along, it is Jesus who is already planning for them to be in the middle of the storm. Isn't it interesting? It is Jesus. I'm absolutely sure Jesus knows what's going to happen. I'm absolutely sure they're going to be caught in the midst of a storm. Jesus knows that. And it's going to be windy. Boat is, all, uh, you know, boat is going to be capsized. They probably will feel like drowning. They will fear for their lives. He already knows all that. And he still says, get into the boat and go. Could it be that sometimes God sets you up to face troubles? That God sets you up to face a financial debacle? Could it be that God sets you up to lose a home, to lose an investment, or to lose a job? Could it be that sometimes God sets you up to lose somebody you love in order to catch you in the middle? No, I don't want that, but I want a miracle. No, that's not possible. I've already proved that in the first, uh, first sermon. You cannot have a miracle without a problem. If you are not willing to be in the middle of a problematic circumstance, how will you ever see God's miraculous hand bringing a miracle in your life? That's not possible, right? Could it be that God did throw somebody into a problem? I love somebody to be into, in the middle of the problem uh, because he does want to show up right in the middle of the stump. I don't know if you like that. But that's what I think. Sometimes God requires us to go into deep waters full of storm and wind before we can see the miraculous. That could be for some of us um, to make decisions that we don't want to, to walk away from our work, to walk away from our financial security, to walk away from a what, what is a sure shot um, financial growth, to walk away from ministry, uh, to, to pursue another mission, to pursue another vision, not ministry, I mean to say, to walk away from one place to another place, to pursue another vision, uh, because uh, God, God does need you to be there. Unless you are there, He cannot do a miracle. Here is what I understood. This entire week, um, when we spent time in prayer, the only thing that I was reading was the book of Genesis. And the stories of uh, you know, the faith heroes in the Bible, uh, from Noah to Joseph. Um, there is one thing that is unmistakable in, the, in, in, in all their lives that God always asked them to do something that they cannot do by themselves. And God always asked them to do something which, whose fulfillment they will never see in their lives. I don't know if you realize that. He always asked them to do something. Uh, the end result, they will never see it. Either Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or Joseph. They never saw how that vision that God gave them come into fulfillment. They never saw that. But God pushed them into the open sea for them to sail through and he showed up in the middle as he rescued them, kept rescuing them. That's probably why Paul says 
in Acts chapter 20. He is going back to a city called Jerusalem. Everybody around him told him, don't go back to Jerusalem because uh, everybody is waiting to kill you. If you go to Jerusalem, it was uh, some of the elders of the church who prophesied to Paul, please don't go to Jerusalem because uh, you will surely not return. Now Paul says something very interesting. Paul says, I am going to Jerusalem. I don't know what is in store for me at Jerusalem. But I know this compelling move that the Spirit of God is asking me to do is to go to Jerusalem. I know everybody is saying I'll, I'll surely not return from Jerusalem. But um, the most sensible thing is not to go to Jerusalem. Um, but I know in my heart that's what God is asking me to do. I, I know th those words seem like a great faith statement, but I also see fear in that. He does not know what's going to happen to him. I'm sure he has that fear. I don't know what's going to happen. But what is between me and the problem at Jerusalem is Jesus. It's the Spirit of God who's prompting me to go there. So I don't care what's going to happen there, but because God told me to go there, I go here is the point. When you get out of the boat, make sure you hear Jesus say, come. Just because I did a rousing message on getting out of the boat, don't get out of the boat. There are two kinds of people in the boats. <laughs> Those who like the boat. They like the comfort of the boat. They don't want to get out of the boat because they do want to get out on the shore, not on the water. They think it's logical, it's not spiritual, it's not, it's not sensible uh, to get out of the boat. The good thing would be to wait for the shore. Uh, I don't blame them, that's okay. Then there are those who, who hear the word come and still don't want to get out of the boat. Eleven of them in that category. Eleven of them. Only Matthew wrote this story, by the way, of Peter getting out of the water in Matthew chapter 14. When I looked at that and saw that Peter got out of the boat, that's where I, I got stuck and I started thinking about this. That I have a choice to sit in the boat or get out of the boat. I have a choice. Now, he, here is the beauty. Whether I sit in the boat or walk on the water, I still will see the miracle. I don't know if you realize that. Did you realize that? All 11 of them actually saw a miracle happening. Jesus walking on the water, getting into the boat, and stopping the you know, storm. And they got to the, boat, uh, to, the, to the shore. Bible says immediately they reached the shore. So you will still go to the shore if you sit in the bo bo boat. No problem. But what you'll miss is to see the miracle by being the miracle itself. That, only Peter got it. Your choice. You can choose to stay inside the boat and sit, wait for the shore, uh, or you can get out of the boat and walk on the water. But make sure you hear the come part. Somebody uh, wrote an article called Cut the Cable. Listen to this statement, okay, very carefully. I'm going to tell you two interesting stories and I'll close, okay? But you've got to pay attention. Um, faith is climbing out on the limb, cutting it off, and watching the tree fall. The first time I read it, it didn't make sense to me. You remember the story of a foolish guy who got up the tree, went to the end of the branch and started sawing it? Nasiruddin Shah's stories, I don't know, what, what do you call it? Uh, in Tinkles, in, 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 in Tinkle, I read the story of how this, this wise guy gets onto the top and cutting it off. And you know what happens, right? You can't cut the branch you are sitting on because you will surely fall. But, he, but this guy says, 
Faith is getting out on a limb. That means go to the end of the branch, sit on it, start cutting the branch. Once you cut the branch, then you actually see tree falling, not you. Now you get it, right? That is faith. He said that cutting the cable. He took that word because uh, um, of, a, of, a, uh, of a guy called Otis. Some of you don't know who Otis is, but you actually travel in what he made almost every single day. It's, it says, by the way, that every three days, the people who got into the Otis elevator or the walkalator or the escalator, whatever, um, the number of the people who would have used the elevator or the escalator or the walkalator um, would be uh, amounting to the number. So many people are using what Otis made, the elevator. Through this, Otis did not make the elevator. His name is Elisha Otis, by the way. He did not make uh, uh, the elevator. Elevator was already invented, by the way. What Otis did is that he invented a system of breaking of the elevators. Okay? That means elevators stopping, going at the high speed and stopping and coming back at, the, at a really high speed down and still managing to stop slowly. That breaking system he invented. Uh, I think in the late part of 1800s, in a trade show, he wanted to show how his braking system works. And so on an elevated platform, which is actually a makeshift uh, elevator, uh, in, in front of this audience that is watching him, he stood on the top of the elevator that has been hanging by a cable. And there he said, I'm going to show you the safest elevators in the world by cutting the cable. And he cut the cable. If he didn't cut the cable, you wouldn't have seen Otis at all. Am I making sense to you? You have to cut the cable. Otherwise, you don't see a miracle. If you're still hanging by that cable, mm, you see, if the cable does fall, sorry, if the elevator does fall and you do die, what do you lose? You don't lose anything. I don't know if you realize that. Especially as a Christian, you don't lose anything at all. Because if you do die, you go to heaven. That is a much better place to be in. If you don't die, you learn something from your life, for your life. That's what happened to Peter. He began to walk and then he started sinking. Then Jesus reached out to him and pulled him up. I think the opposite of failure is not success. I don't think that is what you need to look at it as. The cure for failure is not success. I don't think that is um, the right way to look at failure. Let me make, a, make an observation there. I think we've got to fail sometimes. Failure in small doses builds our immunity to fear. I don't know if you realize, write it down, go back and read it again and again. Okay? Failure in small doses builds our immunity to fear. At some point, after some failures, you forget to fear now. You don't worry about it anymore. That be begins the road to success. That's the difference. I guess that's what Peter learned towards the end of his life. Failures, failures, failures in small doses. But it took away the fear from him. Slowly and slowly. To a point where he could now stand in front of 3,000 people don't care. Start talking about Jesus. You see, here is the beauty thing, beautiful thing, that he's always there to pick you up if you fail. And you will fail. And he's always there to pick you up. Yes, Jesus did reprimand them of uh, the little faith, of their little faith, but he never gave up on them. So he's not going to give up on you at all. 
I don't know if you ever realized, uh, have you, uh, if you ever wondered about this. Why did Jesus walk on the water? Now, I understand five loaves and two fish because people are hungry. I understand a lame man getting up and walking because he's lame. I understand water turning into wine because there is no wine. I understand the next one, the blind man seeing because he's blind. I understand rising up a dead man to, after four days, back to life because he's dead. Why walk on the water? What's the whole point of walking on the water? If Jesus is really concerned about the 12 disciples in the boat, he could have from the mountain, he was on the mountain, right? From the mountain could have said, come, you know, storm, come. And Jesus could have taken the next boat and come. Because we already know that Jesus is not a, not a show guy, right? But why walk on the water? I always had that question in my mind till I saw what Mark wrote in chapter 6, verses 48. Mark writes, Jesus saw they are straining at the oars. Then he began to walk. Oh, you got to read it 10,000 times, okay, to understand that. Jesus saw they were straining at the oars and he began to walk. It's a very important lesson to learn. That we got a God who sees. You know Jehovah Jireh, right? You know Jehovah Rapha, the one who heals. We also have Jehovah Roy. The one who sees. The one who sees. He is right now seeing you right in the middle of the deep ocean and almost sinking and he began to walk. He began to walk. It's going to take 70 minutes for him to reach you. You know what's the calculation? To walk on the water, you know the, the kind of stormy sea that is, right? And if you do really manage to walk on the water, you probably would go around 3.1 miles per hour. Let's, I mean, let's, I mean, let's imagine that. And it would have taken at least 70 minutes for Jesus to reach there, to the boat. In a stormy weather. Wait for the 70th minute. You will see Jesus there. Then don't say ghost. Let's close our eyes. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful joy to have a God um, who cares so much deeply for us. Um, he sees us, um, even though what seems like a really stormy place that you find yourself right now in, uh, it probably is the right place because that's where you see Jesus walking towards you. So I want you to do this today. I, I've been looking at my problem so far, but I'm going to make a choice today to put Jesus in between me and my problem, in between me and my circumstance, in between me and my sickness, in between me and my uh, uh, the, 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 the tough, tough situation at the job, in between me uh, and my broken relationship, in between me and uh, whatever circumstance that you're facing right now, your storm. Make a choice. And do this as you stand if you if you're making that choice stand wherever you are uh, the reason I'm asking you to do that is like Peter I want you to tell Jesus you know what um, I want to get out of the boat so if you want to make that choice and you'll only make that if you put Jesus between you and your waves your circumstance if you're going to do that would you like to stand to your feet wherever you are Wherever you are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, here's the point. I'm going to ask our worship team to sing that, uh, the last song uh, again. And, um, it's a declaration. I believe, I believe, I believe that I have a God of miracles. Do that. That could be your simple prayer to Him. Let it be your prayer today.
to see is moving here in front of me, moving here in front of me. The one who made the deaf to hear, silencing my every fear, silencing my every fear. I believe. we forgot to put you between us and our problems, between us and our sicknesses, between us and our closed doors. But now, we choose to put you between us and our circumstances, God. And by choosing to allow you to be there, right across our eyes, we see more of you, God. And the more we see, the more we experience your love. And that love, we know, will cast away the fear. So we thank you. We believe in you. We believe in you. You are God of miracles. So help us to cut that cable. 
help us to climb off that 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 that, that, that cliff and and choose to jump because we choose we believe that you are holding us right now if we have to take that step of faith to get out of our boat and walk on the water as we hear your word to come help us to do that God. this morning i want to thank you for everyone who's standing here and offering that prayer to you offering that commitment to you saying god i i want to get out of the get out of the boat help me walk i pray that you fill us with faith with trust in you god for you're a god who sees us you're a god who performs amazing things in our lives so help us to choose to believe on that trust in that truth Thank you for everyone who is standing here and offering their prayer to you. May they truly see their miracle right now in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.